Welcome to another episode of Conversations. It's been a while and I hope you're keeping safe. While the world is facing an unprecedented crisis, there is considerable uncertainty as to what its impact would be on people's lives and livelihoods. Where would Sri Lanka's economy stand in the face of the crisis? On today's episode, I will be in conversation with economist and politician, Dr. Harsha De Silva. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you, Alan, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I mean, thank you for sharing your views and insights. Um, the first thing I actually want to know, Dr. Harsha, is there's a lot of speculation as to what's really happening with the Sri Lankan economy. Are we actually facing a recession because of the pandemic or was the Sri Lankan economy headed towards a crisis even before the pandemic? Well, that's a very insightful question, actually, because, uh, yes, we are heading towards a recession. Uh, today, um, former senior deputy governor, uh, Dr. Vijayawadana, uh, says it might even be negative 5%, as opposed to 1.5% uh, projected by the central bank in its annual report just a few weeks ago. Which goes to show how quickly um, things are changing. Um, the reason why we are headed towards a, a negative growth is certainly the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, if not for the pandemic, we would have seen negative growth, but growth would have been anyway pretty low. For the last so many years, growth has been low. Actually, what happened was after the war, for two years consecutively, that is 2010 and 2011, mm -hmm. uh, this country grew rapidly. In fact, in 2012, uh, we touched about 9% real growth. That is because the whole country uh, came on um, uh, track. Uh, the northern farmers were able to get back to their agriculture. The east was in full swing. And there was what is called a, a big a push on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We started building roads and ports and various things. So that necessarily was fueled uh, by debt. Yet we saw a lot of construction and agriculture related activity on the ground. But soon thereafter, it fell. Uh, by uh, 2013, um, growth had fallen to about 3.5% and 2014 to about 4%. And since then, it has hovered around, you know, 5, 4, 35 Now, last year was quite bad, you know, under 3% because of the Easter bomb. So, there's been what you call a structural shift in a growth path. So, yes... We had a growth path and it went up, but it came down and it has been at those levels. There are multiple reasons I can explain what, later. What were the reasons for it to actually fall down? Yeah, it came down because it wasn't sustainable. You know, construction-led growth is not always sustainable. Right? If you're building a road, yes, that gets onto the, the, the GDP, right? But the road gets done. If you're building a, a port, once that is happening, there is activity and then it's done, right? So you can't continue to pour money uh, into large infrastructure projects unless that money is generated internally. So what I told you, uh, I think you got it earlier, was that it was debt fueled. So meaning we borrowed from, in this particular case, essentially from China, we used that money and then we put into these projects. Now, if those projects bring revenue in, then uh, arguably you can continue. But if they don't bring revenue, then you are stuck because you don't have the money. Because one of the big issues that we face as a nation is that we are highly indebted. So right. if you look at um, sort of the cohort of our similar countries, right, with um, what is called a higher middle income, $4,000 per capita, uh, you know, countries in the region and outside. 
most countries that fall into this group uh, have uh, a much, much less debt to GDP uh, component than us. So they are less indebted than us. We are very, very highly indebted. So for instance, um, our debt um, is, uh, if you really think about the numbers, uh, you know, we are indebted to the tune of about $56 billion in terms of foreign debt. Of that $56 billion, uh, about uh, 35, 37 billion is government debt. Then there is debt by private sector. Banks have borrowed from overseas, uh, companies have borrowed uh, overseas, uh, then uh, say uh, state uh, owned enterprises have borrowed overseas, mm -hmm. right? So that debt also needs to be paid from revenue generated basically locally. If you take a company like, let's say, a apparel company, MAS or Brandix or Hydromanis or somebody like that, they may borrow in US dollars in the US, but because their revenue is also in the uh, US in US dollars and so on, that is easily manageable. But if you borrow in dollars, but you earn in rupees, then it becomes a, a, a fairly big challenge to pay back. So. On the one hand, you have the government borrowing, then you have the private sector borrowing, and in, in also in addition, we have central bank borrowing that is from the IMF and so on. And there is about an equal amount of borrowing done locally, meaning the treasury wants to uh, pay bills, pay salaries, uh, pay for samurdi, uh, you know, do all kinds of things that they do, then they can borrow from you and I. Uh, every week or every other week, they have something called a treasury bill or treasury bond auction, which means they will say, I want to borrow, you know, 50 billion rupees. And then they will uh, technically through the central bank ask for bids and people will bid. And based on that, they would borrow. And that goes to the treasury. So like that, we borrow locally and we borrow overseas. But as you would know, right, somebody running a small business perhaps, you know there's a limit to your borrowing. Right, absolutely. So, so, so if you have those limits, and there are prudential limits, right, and, and one is whether we have now breached the limits, that's another story, but you have to be responsible and you can't continue to borrow. So if you borrow and build something, then it certainly has to come to an end at some point. So that is really the reason why those growth rates fell. And now the question is, how do we get it back up again? And for that, uh, we need to do a lot of reforms. When you talk about debts, what actually comes to my mind is it's, it's quite apparent that everyone is playing the blame game. Mm. Um, the current government um, is of the view that um, the economy collapsed because of the UNP. Yeah. But the UNP states that they were paying off debts yeah. of the current government. Yeah. What really is the true story? No, it is, you have to, you know, go beyond petty politics, right? Uh, the issue is when we started uh, you know, out in 1948, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the editorial in the, um, I believe it was the Time newspaper in London, was Ceylon, uh, the Switzerland, emerging Switzerland of Asia. Oh, wow. That is how we were uh, sort of uh, placed. We had uh, only one country ahead of us in terms of how rich we were as people, what we call per capita uh, GDP, per capita income, and that country was Japan. You know, they called Korea because Korea was, uh, you know, it was a slum, right? Thailand uh, and, uh, you know, uh, countries like that uh, were far below us. Um, it was for us to take it and run, 
But what happened? Since then, we continue to fall. So you can't blame one government. It has been governments from day of independence, 72 years till today. In the meantime, some countries prospered. For instance, in, in, in a lifetime, Singapore went from a country with uh, squatting pants, right, to one of the richest countries in the world with a per capita, uh, you know, GDP um, of maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars and they were not even a country at the time. They were part of uh, Malaysia. And the great story uh, how uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, when he came to Colombo on his way uh, from London, um, he got off and he saw Colombo and he said, I want to make Singapore like Colombo. You know, and, and in his memoirs, he had said what happened to Ceylon and how we avoided the problems that Ceylon uh, got into. So, on, I mean, to very sort of broad brush thinking that I have, one is the, the sort of the entitlement welfare politics, right? Populist governments giving stuff away, right? right? And, and, and by giving stuff away, you try to get people to vote for you, keeping people poor letting them not really perform to their, uh, you know, uh, uh, abilities. Like, I think voting should be based on your policies. And and like you said, it's not about giving giving gifts away and then buying your votes. Yeah, I mean, look at what, what is happening. I mean, uh, you know, it's just give, give, give. How much can you give? Right. Right? So, I mean, you have to uh, work hard. You know, when the, the Central Bank of Singapore was uh, established, uh, the governor uh, made a statement. He said, uh, you know, if the Central Bank can print money, uh, uh, you know, and make countries rich, uh, then, you know, to the effect that anybody can be rich. But it doesn't happen like that. You have to work hard. Only if you work hard, you become rich and, and your country becomes rich. So one is that the, the entitlement, welfare type politics, on the one hand. On the other, it was the inability of Sri Lankans to be Sri Lankans. We want to be Sinhalese, we want to be Tamil, we want to be Muslim, and then we fought with uh, each other. Brutal war, you know. For 30 years, you know, we fought a war. And now again, uh, there are simmering indications of, you know, our inability uh, to treat everybody as equal. So these two things, you know, have essentially caused the, the, the way I see it, uh, misery, maybe not the best word to use, but really, you know, if you, you're being critical. Um, and of course, more recently, uh, our unwillingness uh, to to uh, reform our economy, uh, our unwillingness to be uh, part of a competitive landscape, our unwillingness to open Sri Lanka to the rest of the world, right? Our unwillingness uh, to uh, let our people really. Uh, you know, play to their uh, strengths. So all these things uh, brought us from here to here. Yeah, I mean, if if you were given uh, the chance of handling the economy right now and given the current crisis, how would you do things differently? <laughs> I um, How would very, you do things differently? Yeah, I am an out-of-the-box thinker. Right. Um, you know, when in 2013, my dear friend almost died uh, in uh, Kantale. Uh, we got into an accident. A uh, few of us were coming back from Kutsaveli. Uh, we had gone uh, on the, you know, for the long weekend and there was a cyclone warning and we had to come back. It was raining really hard. We were driving too fast and one of the vehicles spun out of control and, and Amina. Uh, we call a mini, 
um, was on the road like a lump uh, with um, spinal cord injury. And, and we couldn't get an ambulance, you know, to get her to Colombo. But it's a long story. We managed to uh, bring her. Mm -hmm. And um, after an eight hour operation, she's fine now. She goes swimming and dancing and all of that. I thought to myself, the first thing I will do if ever I get the opportunity as a part of a government, I will create an ambulance service for this country. And you did that. And I did that. Yes. And that is what today you see go out on the road, right. 1990s was area. It was just an idea that I got because of an accident. And then I worked my way through. I personally spoke to Mr. Narendra Modi. Uh, you know, there's only a uh, few people who were there at that very first meeting in parliament. The main person being Mr. Yashwan Singha, who was then the uh, High Commissioner here. Subsequently, he was a Indian High Commissioner of the UK. Um, and when I told Mr. Modi, look, this is what I would like you to do to help me, will you do, will you help me? He said immediately, yes, I will help you. A long story. Then I got uh, Prime Minister Vikram Singh to officially write to uh, Prime Minister Modi. And today we run Sri Lanka's most efficient public service. I challenged anyone, anyone to uh, show me something that works better than 1990s. Sorry. We work 24 hours of the day, seven days of the week every nook and cranny in this country. Today we get about 8,500 calls every single day. 98% of the calls are answered in the first string. Of course, during the COVID crisis, those numbers have gone a bit haywire. Right. But I mean, on a normal day. And our response time in Colombo is um, under eight and a half minutes. Our response time, all over the country is under 13 minutes, right? We take to emergency and critical care 1,500 people every single day. And just imagine how many lives we save, right? And uh, we have taken over 600,000 people so far. That is incredible. It is incredible. Yes. So if anybody watching this program does not have our app on your phone, please download it. It is on your iOS and your, uh, what is the other one? Uh, the, the Apple and Android. the Android, yes. right? Yes, and Android. it's just one, one press of a button. You got to press it twice and we will be there. It'll save us maybe 30 to 45 seconds in our response. So I'm bringing technology uh, to everything we do is the way forward because we cannot produce simple products anymore, Alanki. Anybody can uh, stitch a shirt if in, you know, okay, it'll take a little while to figure right. it out. But not everybody can get together and build a computer. Not everybody right. can get together and run an uh, amazing technology-driven service. Indeed. So my, my, my solution is very simple. We go from simple products, a country that is producing simple products and paying those people who work in those factories small, a small salary to producing complex products and paying them salaries that are, uh, that are uh, equivalent uh, to the kind of skill that you put in to create complex products. So I don't have the time to explain here, but give you a simple example. It's like Scrabble. Say, if you make uh, the word C-A-T, which is simple, you know, how many points can you get? As opposed to you make the word priority, for example, how many points can you get? Right? Right. So that is where we need to go to making from making the word cat to making the word priority. I like what you said, you know, thinking out of the box. And I think as policymakers, it's very important that you don't just see what's right ahead of you, but you also learn to see the bigger picture. 
But uh, Dr. Harsha, I was very interested in this. I, I learned that um, so the government has decided to borrow 15 billion rupees to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to construct roads. And this comes at a time when the secretary to the president also requested that state sector employees sacrifice a part of their wages. I mean, what are your views on this? Well, I saw that. And the paper I'm writing refers precisely to that. Um, I am saying, well, I spoke about priority. I wasn't planning on using that word here in answering this question. I'm saying reprioritize. I am saying move away from uh, building roads for a moment that are not essential. Okay, we need the Central Expressway. That must go ahead. But improving roads in Hambantota for 15 billion rupees, I don't think is priority. I am saying take that money and build a network of climate control warehouses for agricultural produce. Um, I started the first one. This is again out of the box thinking. I, for a very short period of time, uh, towards the end of our government, had a uh, ministry, a non-cabinet ministry. I was never good enough to be given a cabinet job. Were you unhappy with it? Well, I would have been happier if they gave me, gave me some real right. power to do something good. You know, I've done all what I've done. I've done without any authority, you know, f you know, sort of fought my way through. But even this one, in the non-cabinet ministry of public distribution, and the very first um, uh, technology driven um, uh, warehouse for agriculture, uh, I started building in Dambulla, right next to the Dambulla market on a six and a half acre plot at about three and a half acres. We are building uh, 5,000 metric ton capacity uh, warehouse, which we have broken down into six chambers. Each chamber can have uh, a combination of humidity and temperature. So suppose you have onions and to store onions for let's say three months, you need to have a certain humidity. You need the suitable conditions. That's right. right. Hu humidity and temperature. Let's say the next one is, um, uh, let's say um, something else, let's say strawberries. So this is the kind of thinking that one requires. Right, so that was the first one. Government didn't have money. Again, I spoke to the Indian High Commissioner and uh, he wrote a check for 300 million rupees, right? Grant, that is the money that I used because I have a very, very uh, good relationship with uh, India because um, for 1990, they wrote a check, believe me, they wrote a check, a gift, a grant, never to be paid back for $23.2 million. Wow. That is the second largest grant given by India to Sri Lanka ever. The first one was for the tsunami housing. And they believe that it was absolutely worth it because look at what we created, right? So keep that aside. And here with that money and another 225 million rupees from the budget of my non-cabinet ministry, we started building this. And that is going to become, which the paper that I'm writing and I'm going to send it to the president to, for consideration for their economic uh, plan coming out of COVID, is going to be part of the infrastructure that would then uh, connect uh, farmers uh, across the country on an online platform, right? Which is what I started building with what is called the Govinyana Seva in 2003. Right. So <clears throat> by creating this, you not only create employment in the short term, but create a stable market for agricultural produce. Right. I mean, where do, where do you get your ketchup from? Where? I mean, uh, how many how much of ketchup is produced here? Right. Not much. Not much. Right. Then if you look at uh, dehydrated uh, fruits, how much of it do we do? How many times have you seen on a television or the Lankadipa newspaper 
elephants and a place called the Gampatana feasting on, on vegetables. You've probably seen it, right? right? Why? Because there's so much of produce that is thrown away, right? The number is 40%. 40% of everything that is harvested in terms of fruits and vegetables get thrown away. Not processed, not stored, no uh, climate control logistics, not exported, right? So, yes, improving a road is good, but instead of spending money on that now, spend that money uh, to implement uh, what people like us have been talking about with evidence, with data, having shown that it works for the last almost, you know, 17 years. Do you think, do you think as, a, as a government they have an exit strategy? I think they have some strategy. I don't want to be overly critical of the government because they have done a reasonably good job given the circumstances. Uh, I know this because of what I see every day in terms of the frontline healthcare staff. But my sort of major uh, point of departure uh, is that uh, the number of tests uh, that we did, I wish if we did more tests, we would have been able to exit from the lockdown a lot earlier, perhaps. So I've come to the final question for you. Yeah. In a nutshell, how has your political journey been so far? <laughs> it's a Honestly. Very, yeah, it's a very difficult question to answer. Because I almost said I'm done and walked away uh, just before the nominations uh, were called this time around. And uh, Sajid just told me, Harsha, don't leave, you know. We need you. Please come back. And I came back again. That's the honest truth. Why right? did you want to leave? I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. Right. right? You, you're criticized all the time. Um, the, uh, you see, it's dirty, right? right? Um, and, um, you know, uh, there are many things I can do, right? I, I don't have to be doing this. Uh, stress is very high. But of course, there is the upside, and that is when you see you can make change. You know, let's take what I did. I mean, if I wasn't the minister, I would not have been able to get this done. You know, the uh, suicide. I would have wanted to do it, but I would never have been able to get it done. Right? I pushed uh, people. I got money. You know, after the, 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 the grant ran out, you know, we put 2 billion rupees every year uh, in running this. So put cabinet papers, took, uh, an, I created a new piece of legislation in parliament called the 1990 Sosaria Fund, right, which, which runs this uh, service, right. So when you are able to deliver, you feel really good because if you're not, uh, in a position of authority, you can't do it. Um, something that comes to my mind is, I was part, uh, for, for some time, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. And Mangala told me, Harsha, your job is do whatever it takes um, and negotiate to get GSP Plus back, right? So I was a point man. I was up and down from Brussels and Geneva, and then we met people, and then, you know, it's a long process. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had to get so many things approved by cabinet, the president, the prime minister, foreign minister. Uh, and then uh, there was an unexpected uh, resolution brought against us uh, in the European Parliament in Brussels. Uh, say about uh, two weeks before everything was to be finalized. Mm -hmm. And they said, don't give it to Sri Lanka. It was brought by some Spanish uh, members of the European Parliament. They told me, get on a plane, go, right? And then, uh, you know, see what's wrong and try to make sure that we win this uh, or we defeat the resolution in, in Brussels. Uh, that was an amazingly exciting uh, uh, task that I was handed over. And I went and spoke to the different country groups 
and some people told me hasha for instance i remember the labor party in the the, the, the group uh, in the mep said you know nothing against sri lanka but we have to vote with those guys you know socialist guys on the on the uh, you know resolution from spain and all but we ended up winning it right uh, the resolution got 100 votes we ended up getting 450 votes won by a massive uh, beat it by a massive margin and that i would never have been able to do it if i was not the point man and the deputy minister uh, for foreign affairs in charge of what's called economic diplomacy so there are those upside that you know events that make you feel or when you go out on the road somebody says you know thank god for you know the you know my mother's life was saved because uh, the ambulance arrived right on time so, you know and i say you know i'm really happy that uh, she's fine you know we save lives so so those you do have an impact on people's lives i hope people can appreciate at least to some you know <laughs> marginal level that i've done something right because if i can't do things for people then there's no point right i mean i have never distributed a takarang sheet to get myself elected right i can't do it right and and um, so the ups and downs right i hate campaigning in that you know you, you it's it's you know you want to sell yourself right, right. You know, i am good vote for me i am this vote for me i am that vote for me because that is that is the democratic structure right um and uh, so so the goods and bads but if you sort of put everything together uh i am now once again rejuvenated i am reactivated and i want to continue with this uh, uh journey that i began i want to reach uh, a place where i can make some real meaningful change in this country i i i have uh, academic background in economics um i've have uh, a a background as an entrepreneur um and uh, then um i've worked with the world bank adb um uh and university pan university network in africa idrc canada uh, and of course my favorite learn asia here in colombo regional office I've worked in about 20 countries. I've worked with kings in Bhutan. I've worked with uh, you know ministers of electricity. I've worked uh, in Nepal. I've flown Buddha Air on the, the you know uh, you know just over the the Everest because we were doing a big project and setting up what are called VSATs to bring uh, uh, you know communication Uh, to villages in uh, the eastern region of nepal you know i've worked in, uh, in you know in african countries so all of that experience then i've taught uh, as a visiting professor uh, at the moruto university at the sri jayawardenepur university mba program um I, so uh, all that background all that experience i bring you know my only sibling who is a, a pediatrician you know takes care of kids my father is still living and my wife and so you know i bring to the table i think a fairly unique set of not just skills but experience experiences right and i'm just a regular guy right um, you know on a friday night you know <laughs> meet up with the friends you know um you know and um, enjoy a drink or you know and <laughs> and uh, just play with the kids uh, when they are home or when i i is home for the holidays or uh, with nangi so and i understand right M- my mother died when i was a, when i was a young man adolescent young young when i was in school right i grew up without a mother most of my Uh, my adolescent life i almost completely screwed up i would have ended up in some gutter somewhere that was the impact of my mother's death 
I went from here to here and then I came back up because I knew that I had to fight back. Life is tough. Life is not fair. Life is never fair. You have to take the opportunities that come your way. You got to put your heart and soul and fight, right? So, so politics is, well, you know, like I said, stuff, it has its ups and downs, but, and I almost gave up, but I'm back and not going to give up again because I'm focused now and I want to get to a, a place where I can change this country. I wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your insights with us. It was truly valuable for me and I'm sure for our viewers as well. We have come to the end of uh, this conversation, uh, but I would like to thank Dr. Harsha Deseva, truly a gentleman in politics, um, for sharing this time with all of us. Do not forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and thank you for watching. Stay home if possible and stay safe. Thank you.